Howdy folks, Justin here. Welcome to From Loser to Legend, Episode 6, Deck Building 101. Uh, where, as usual, we take you from that guy up top, Loser, couldn't find his deck with both hands, to this guy over here, uh, I got one hand right, this guy over here, uh, huge deck, incredible deck building skills, um, the kind of guy whose deck uh, everyone else wants to uh, have. So, uh, how we're going to do that, we're going to talk about some cards that... Uh, you know, you might use to build a deck around. We're going to talk about the other way you can build a deck, which is sort of like countering the meta decks. And we're going to talk about some basic cards that uh, you should definitely consider putting in every deck that is running certain colors and why you should be running them. As well as a couple questions you should ask yourself while you're building a deck. So let's get rid of this image here. I'm getting better with this technology every day. My videos are, uh, you know. I expect the Academy to be calling any time now to let me know that they're interested in uh, my editing and production work. So, the first thing that you need to do is decide what kind of deck do you want to build. You know, what, what is your goal here? Uh, and there are a couple different ways you can approach this. The first thing uh, that people do, and this is how the Legends meta started back uh, you know, in closed beta, is you just look at the cards and you find cards that motivate you to build around them. And, you know, these are like the basic build around cards from which you, you know, come up with a cohesive strategy. And these are usually pretty linear decks. And this is, you know, the origin of, of, a, of a meta, basically. Um, these are the first generation of decks to arise. Um, Examples of these straightforward kinds of decks are decks that revolve around one of the cards I wanted to talk about today. In Intelligence, we have Drez Tormentor. Okay, four Magicka, three four. When an enemy creature becomes shackled, deal three damage to it. In May, June, and even in July, there were a lot of decks uh, running this card along with all the, all the shackle effects, like Mace of Encumbrance. There's a couple green cards that do this. Um, the Shrieking Harpy in blue. And, uh, because this is a very clear and obvious place to start deck building. Um, there are some, uh, there, there are some cards that have been, have proven so powerful that they still have an impact on the meta right now. Also, in Intelligence, we have Little Andral Hexmage. I think that Action Mage is still a very viable deck. Um, and, and, and it's, they're the sorts of cards that when you see them and you find them, you know that you can find all sorts of other cards to support them. In the case of Hexmage, you know, it, it's pretty obvious. It just combos well, or combines well, with uh, any action spell, right? Because it, it amplifies the impact of each one of those spells, you know, increasing the magic of value you're getting for the magic of cost you're paying. Um, a couple other cards that uh, are worth considering. Iliac Sorcerer. This is uh, one of the few ways in this game you can kill someone in a single turn from 30 life. Uh, you know, the, you, you usually combine this card with bl uh, intelligence cards, with blue cards that grant wards, and then you just beef up its power, you double it. You know, by removing the ward, you, you give it ward again, you beef it up again, so on and so forth. And if you were building an Iliac Sorcerer deck, you know, you first you would identify this as a card that you wanted to play around with, and then you would look for cards that combo well with it. Uh, there are a number of cards like this. Uh, like I said, most of them are in Intelligence, but if Iliac Sorcerer was the place we were starting from for deck building, we would look at cards like Crown Quartermaster, which give us a steel dagger that we could use to increase its spell, uh, its attack. We would look at Lesser Ward, so we could give it an additional ward. Same reason we would look at um, Ward Crafter, another way to give it ward so that after we removed it, we could double it again. Uh, you know, other cards what you would include would be uh, Dumber Nightblade. My golden Dumber Nightblade here is waiting to be disenchanted when it gets uh, nerfed. Because <laughs> I'm going to cash in on 200 soul shards for that. Um, you know, you would look for th anything that synergized with your objective, which was killing a person with Iliac Sorcerer. Similar to the Drez Tormentor, where you were looking for any card that would synergize with your desire to gain extra value out of the effect of Dress Tormentor, which it gives you extra value out of Shackling creatures, so like Shrieking Harpy. Uh, there are a few other cards like this I wanted to mention. Another uh, pretty linear one is in green, 
Uh, it is the Goblin Lord Murkwater Skirmisher. Uh, it's a 4-4 four, for four, 4, already totally playable stats, and when you play it, you give all your other friendly goblins plus 2, plus 2. Goblins are another example of one of the earliest uh, Elder Scrolls Legends decks. Um, there were Assassin Goblin decks in blue-green, there were Archer Goblin decks in red-green, uh, red and uh, there... Well, I mean, no, I never saw anybody else play it, but I played a lot of Monk um, Goblin in yellow-green. Uh, because it, it's a fairly obvious linear strategy, but it's the sort of thing that still can be playable today. You just find a card you want, you want to you know, maximize your value out of, Murkwater Skirmisher in this case, and then you start hunting for goblins, right? You've got, I mean, I'll just pull up my list chart here, actually, yellow-bellied goblins. And we've got Murkwater Goblin. We've got uh, Goblin Skulk. We've got Murkwater Butcher, Murkwater Savage, Murkwater Skirmisher, and of course Tazgad is actually a goblin. Um, and once you have that, the, the basic stuff, the obvious stuff to include in the deck, and using this, we'll use this as an example to continue, you start looking at the cards that so generally support the strategy, but are not you know, obvious shoe-ins, because in this case they're not goblins, or they don't shackle, or they don't double, they're not, they don't increase your Iliac Sorcerer's power. Uh, in this case, uh, I knew that this was going to be a pretty aggressive deck, so I wanted, you know, really powerful aggressive creatures. So, of course, I looked to descend into Valkosh, which is a creature that just com gets completely out of control very quickly. I looked to Ungolim, because, uh, you know, it's Ungolim. It's got some great value, uh, potentially. And if this is a deck that could, you know, get away with playing a 2-1-for-1 one one and never getting an assassin and, and being okay with it, because it wants that one turn one play. During Cut Purse, because it's a high-value 2-drop creature that escalates out of control, 5th Legion Trainer beefs up all your otherwise sort of unimpressive goblin bodies, and of course, Murkwater Goblin combos with another goblin, Goblin Skulk, pulls it out of your deck, Mournhold Trader, just a giant body for 2 Magicka, Dune Smuggler, uh, it allows for, you know, evading guard creatures, East March Crusader grants a little bit of draw, House Kinsman is going to give you value even if it slams into a guard creature, uh, and... You know, these are just creatures that fit the general strategy that goblins represented, which was a really aggressive deck. Then you look at, um, you know, both literally and figuratively support cards, like Divine Fervor. You're playing a lot of creatures. They're small. You want to make them bigger. Obvious. Anasi, great card in these colors. Uh, the deck, you know, you start looking at your deck's weaknesses. What is the weakness of your strategy? That's the next step here, and this is what some of these other cards address. Uh, Anasi addresses one of the weaknesses of the deck, which is opposing creatures with guard and opposing creatures with drain. Steals it all. Suddenly your opponent's creatures don't have drain, don't have guard. Profit. Um, and then Skuma Racketeer was the, another card added to address this issue. Uh, let's say you have a Murkwater Goblin or an Angolim or a 1-1 uh, you know, Imperial Grunt. Uh, and, and then you have a Sench Tiger sitting across from you. This is something that you know I considered when building this deck. Suddenly, you're able to get a lot of value by slamming your 1-1 one, one with Lethal now into that guard. So this overcomes another weakness of the general strategy. This is you know the third part of uh, building a coherent linear deck. And then finally, East March Crusader fits into this this, this category more than the others. Uh, because this card deck can easily run out of fuel. You know, you just you burn through your stuff so quickly. Uh, you need to get some more cards in play. East March Crusader, perfect for this sort of strategy because it draws you a card and helps uh, helps you with the, the uh, closing. You know, closing the game by making sure you have enough things to just keep throwing at your opponent. So those are cards that uh, address the weaknesses in the deck inherently. Um, So that's that's the basic, the most basic way to come up with a deck, right? Um, obviously, there are, are some additional things that are worth considering when you're building a deck of any kind, and we're going to get into the second kind of deck building that I think is important uh, to recognize here in just a second. But the other uh, the other couple things that are really important to consider are what removal spells should I be running, right? Now, the most blinding aggressive deck is still probably going to benefit some somewhat from the ability to remove opposing creatures. Because, you know, a lightning bolt does 4 damage for 4 magicka, right? But a 4-4 four, four creature for 4 magicka has the potential to do an infinite amount of damage, right? That lightning bolt is always just doing 4. There are, of course, some some weak, some uh, some risks involved in playing a creature. But, uh, 
generally speaking, keeping your creatures alive by using removal to destroy opposing creatures that would otherwise remove your creatures is a really good way to, to get a lot of value out of your creatures. So you, you need to be aware of the different removal options in the colors that you're playing. So I'm just going to go over the most powerful removal options in each color and comment briefly on wh whether or not it's one you should be considering for the type of deck you're building. Uh, in red a lot of the red removal, if you will, comes in si the form of silence effects, like Bone Bow and Earth Bone Spinner. Those are something that you should definitely keep in mind, but they're not exactly what we're addressing right here. But Bone Bow and Earth Bone Spinner are both playable cards. Earth Bone Spinner is a great card, and if you're looking for a silence effect in your red deck, Earth Bone Spinner is where I would start looking. Uh, the other th cards worth mentioning, Stone Throw is not bad, but it's so conditional that I would hesitate to run it in uh, a deck outside of Arena, so I'm not really going to address it. First one I'm going to address, though, is Cast Out. Cast Out is one of the few uh, direct, you know, it, the few removal options in uh, in red. And it does a really good job of, of generating tempo, which we discussed in a previous video, which is where you uh, gain a better position on board, um, you know, where you put momentum in your favor. Uh, by just bouncing a creature to it to uh, your opponent's hand, you can return, of course, your own creatures to your hand if you have a charge creature you want to get double mileage of or out of or something like that. But for the most part, you're going to use this card to return an opposing creature with drain or guard to your opponent's hand, so you can seal the game. Uh, cast out is probably not particularly playable in a red uh, running control deck, but in a red based aggro deck, it's definitely worth considering. And in a red mid-range strategy, I'm kind of torn. I think, generally speaking, whatever color you're splashing red with is going to have better removal options than cast out if you're running uh, something less than a, a pretty aggressive deck. But cast out is definitely worth looking at in a more aggressive deck. The other, I mean, there are other removal spells I'm not going to get into, but I'm just trying to address the ones that are most playable. Uh, Burn and Pillage is, of course, the... Uh, poster child for red removal spells and when you're asking yourself am I a red deck that wants to run burn and pillage ask yourself you know around turn six seven or eight have I done enough damage to my opponent to where a burn and pillage could devastate them uh, if the answer is yes then you should run burn and pillage because burn and pillage is an incredibly powerful and unique effect in this game um, the only other card that does much of anything like this is Odiving, uh, who for 12 Magicka does 4 damage to all opposing creatures. Um, as a guy who builds control decks that try to stabilize around 5 to 10 life, uh, Burn and Pillage is my arch, arch nemesis. Um, because this is the sort of deck, this is the sort of, this card, you know, makes comeback a lot more difficult for those sorts of decks. This is de you know, if you're building any sort of deck where you're going to start falling behind after an aggressive start, and you're running red, Burn and Pillage is probably a card you want to be looking at. Another removal, uh, another color that you uh, often see paired with red these days is blue, and we're going to be looking now at the most usable blue removal spells and whether or not you should be running them in your deck. Firebolt, Firebolt's a pretty great spell. Um, one magic to do two damage to a creature can both allow you to trade up your smaller creatures if the opposing creature has more than two health, or just outright destroy a lot of creatures, including, after the patch hits, uh, Moonlight Werebat and House Kinsman, which we'll probably see slightly less play after the patch, but I would venture to say they're probably still going to be fairly common cards, certainly more common than most cards. Uh, Firebolt, I think, fits into almost any blue strategy, so I wouldn't, uh, I wouldn't discourage anybody running blue from running Firebolt. Uh, the other two cards I want to look at are... Lightning Bolt, and my comments on this are quite simple. If you're running blue, you should run Lightning Bolt, because it is an incredible removal spell. Uh, it's perfectly costed, it has prophecy. Um, when you're running blue and you're building a deck, and you're asking yourself what removal I should be running, Lightning Bolt is one of your answers. And then the other one, which requires a little bit more thought, uh, although not a whole lot, is Ice Storm. Ice Storm is a really powerful effect, one of the few area of effect spells in the game. Uh, area effect spells being spells that do damage to, to all creatures. Um, 
there are blue based decks that don't need to be running Ice Storm, of course. Um, most Action Mage decks don't play Ice Storm. Um, most Assassin decks don't play Ice Storm. However, what you need to ask yourself when you're uh, considering whether or not to put Ice Storm into the deck you're building is around turn 6, 7, or 8, uh, will I benefit more than my opponent does if 3 damage is dealt to all creatures? Um, if the answer is yes, then Ice Storm's a shoe into your deck. You know, it fits well in Sorcerer, fits well into uh, Mage, uh, uh, Control Mage, I'm sorry, fits well into the Battle Mage decks that are popular right now, the, uh, the, the more controlling Battle Mage lists. Um, the only, I mean, it's a pretty straightforward question. If the answer is yes, run the card. Okay. In yellow, I'm going to talk about two cards. There are a lot of removal options in yellow. Brief note: Imprison. Imprison's not terrible. If you're running token, I mean, the only I would only put this in either a mono yellow or a yellow purple tokens deck. Um, if you feel like you can trigger it because you're running Divine Fervor. I'm sorry, not Divine Fervor, Imperial Reinforcements, Scouting Patrol, and maybe even cards like the Wolf that generates another Wolf in the other lane, then the answer is yes, you should run Imprison. But generally speaking, Imprison is a... It's kind of an iffy one. Especially since Yellow has such a fantastic removal spell in the same co uh, same costing... Uh, in, in Execute. Execute's a really powerful card. I think the question, you know, the question, should I be running Execute in my yellow base deck, is basically going to always be yes. There are going to be times when it is a dead card in your hand, but those times are so much fewer than those times when it is fantastic that the answer is yes to should I be running Execute as removal in my deck. Uh, finally, the other one <laughs> that I'm going to point out is even more obvious, Piercing Javelin. Uh, is there a yellow icon next to my deck's title? Yes, then I need to run Piercing Javelin. Uh, now, I know that there is no Piercing Javelin in that Yellow-Bellied Goblins deck, but that Yellow-Bellied Goblins deck is also not good. So, <laughs> it's not uh, something you should really look to as inspiration for Piercing Javelin. Yellow-Bellied Goblins is a fun deck, but it is not um, particularly competitive. Uh, Piercing Javelin is a shoe into any deck that you're building that has yellow in it. Okay, we're going to go to green. The ones that I think are most important to point out are two of them here at two cost. Finish off. Uh, finish off is a kind of a, a tough choice for a lot of decks. It's sees play more play in archer and in monk than anywhere else. But the question you need to ask yourself is: is with finish off, do I have multiple ways to trigger it, um, or do I have cards that generate multiple bodies where I don't mind, you know, losing one? Basically, the question with Finish Off that you need to be able to answer is, is my deck somehow able to d negate the card, the theoretical card disadvantage, the fact that I might be using two resources to remove one opposing creature that Finish Off represents? Do I have a way to combat that? If yes, then Finish Off is a super powerful card and you should be running it. Um, if no, you might still consider running it if uh, the color you're mixing with doesn't have a lot of options for removal. But Finish Off is... Uh, you know, you need to just be able to make up the loss of uh, card advantage by doing things like running Triumphant Yarl or uh, other sorts of card draw. Murkwater Witch is another card that you should seriously consider running in your green decks. Um, and I'm putting it in the removal category because there are a lot of creatures, a lot of pretty powerful creatures that can be uh, can be eliminated completely with Murkwater Witch. And if you are thinking about... Um, Removal in terms of removal plus attack, you know, a, a damage dealt by one of your creatures, like we talked about with Firebolt. Murkwater Witch is a great example of that, and it's a card that combos well in a lot of the same situations that Finish Off combos with, or works in, sorry. <clears throat> sorry, I got a bit of a cold, I'm kind of choking. <laughs> and the other uh, removal spells I wanted to look at, just one actually is one that I think belongs in just about every green deck. Uh, and there, of course, are other removal spells like Territorial Viper, arguably Cliff Racer. But the one I wanted to mention that you need to ask yourself about is Leaf Lurker. Uh, if, uh, as opposed to finish off, Leaf Lurker leaves behind a 4-3 body after you trigger it. Uh, so you really don't need to be so concerned with the card disadvantage when, in fact, Leaf Lurker can often generate card advantage. Uh, if you, if 
the opposing creature attacked into one of your creatures and both are still alive, using Leaf Lurker to remove the opposing creature generates card advantage because you have an additional body on board, they have lost a resource and you have not. The question, should I put Leaf Lurker in my green deck that I'm building? The answer is probably going to be yes, actually, <laughs> no matter what you're doing. Um, there are some decks that do not run Leaf Lurker, but they are few and far between. Uh, Leaf Lurker is just generally good. I would put it in my green decks. Um, finally, purple. Uh, as far as purple removal options go, there's a couple I wanted to mention. Uh, you may notice that purple has a lot of creatures with lethal. I think that uh, considering these as part of purple's removal suite is pretty important and pretty reasonable. Um, you know, Daedric Dagger, Deadly Draugr. You know, Deadly Draugr actually used to see a lot of play. Um, the Rise of Archer sort of made Daily Draugr a lot less playable, but it's still, a, you know, an option when you're in these colors. The ones that I really wanted to mention are Frostbite Spider. I've kind of been getting on this card lately. Um, it sees no play in Constructed. I don't think it's bad, actually. I think it's a pretty reasonable card that's just been overlooked because it's very simple. Um, and Frostbite Spider is a card you should consider as part of your removal suite if you're running a purple-based deck, although I would not... Uh, be enthusiastic, excited about removing it, or playing it, it is definitely something to consider. Uh, the other, oops, I passed by it, the other card I want to talk about is Mummify. This is sort of removal, but again, purple doesn't have a lot of direct removal options, but Mummify can neutralize almost entirely any creature on the board, so when you're looking at uh, your purple base decks, Mummify is going to find its way into most of them, if, uh, you know, if uh, you're looking for something that you want to, you know, use as unconditional removal, basically. I mean, you are giving them a 2-2 two -two Shriveled Mummy, but I wouldn't be super concerned about that. And finally, there's one last card that deserves a mention. Um, there are, there are of course, some two-color removal spells. Uh, you know, Elena Banach, uh, notably, of course, Edict of Azura. If you can run Edict of Azura, uh, run Edict of Azura. But the other one I wanted to mention is Crushing Blow. To the question, should I run Crushing Blow in my uh, any color deck? The answer is probably yes. Um, it's not in every deck, but I think you could make a case for it being in almost any any deck. Uh, there are a lot of creatures. I mean, I've talked about this card many times before in this video. Crushing Blow belongs in your deck if you don't have a whole bunch of three drops already. If on turn three, there you 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 might think to yourself it's more advantageous to remove an opposing creature than it is to play one. Or, if your deck in general doesn't have a lot of reach, which we talked about in uh, one of our episodes, reach being the ability to uh, kill your opponent without having a board state that's favorable for you in the beginning of that turn, you know, reaching across the board without directly interacting with it. If you're the colors you're playing don't have a whole lot of reach, Crushing Blow is another shoe in because it's removal that doubles as reach. Um... Finally, as far as the other thing I wanted to talk about, about uh, how to build decks goes, uh, in, as far as what cards should I include in my list, is card draw. Um, generating card advantage, which we talked about in a previous video, I'm not going to go over which cards do this, but cards that generate any sort of card advantage are always worth a look and should be prioritized in the lit number of cards that you're running in your deck. Even cards like Sharpshooter Scout have the ability to generate card advantage because, you know, it's going to come into play and do one damage to a creature. If that kills an opposing creature and you're left with a Sharpshooter Scout that you can then leverage, you know, against opposing creatures again or continue to generate value with by attacking your opponent, Sharpshooter Scout, you know, is worth considering putting in your deck. Uh, you know, on the surface, Nord Firebrand and Sharpshooter Scout may appear similar. They both offer a form of reach. But as far as card advantage goes, only Sharpshooter Scout offers, uh, you know, immediate, obvious uh, card advantage. Um, every color has cards that, it, you know, contribute to card advantage. And I addressed this in um, the episode of From Loser to Legend that talks about card advantage. I, can, I highly recommend you check that video out uh, and seriously consider including any number of those cards that generate card advantage in your decks because they are basically what's going to be required for you to win if you don't curve out perfectly your first several turns and you need to you know gain uh, you need to leverage some sort of advantage to, to continue to, to to fight in the game 
card advantage is going to give you that ability. The last point, uh, as far as the you know general deck building cost, uh, skills goes, that I wanted to mention, is you need to ask yourself how do I win. And this brings us back to the first point where I'm talking about build around cards. Um, but when you you know let's say your your build around card is uh, Dress Tormentor. Dress Tormentor is a great basis for a strategy. But it's not necessarily the card that you draw and you think, all right, now I've got this. Um, you know, each color has a number of ways that you can seal the deal, and, and it is a you know, a, it's a reasonable strategy too. Just think, uh, I'm just going to generate uh, a series of progressively more powerful creatures, at curve out and win. That is a strategy. Running the best creature stat-wise for that cost um, in two strong colors you know, basically a pile of good cards is a strategy, and it can answer your question, how do I win? But it's not always so obvious. You know, for a lot of control decks, the question is, the, the question of how do I win is a little more complicated because you're spending so much of your deck controlling the board and removing opposing threats. Um, sorry, my throat's seizing up on me again. Um, to that point, how do I win? A lot of people answer that with in control decks with cards like Blood Magic Lord. Uh, you know, potentially a re recurring uh, source of card advantage. A giant creature um, creates multiple bodies. Um, and in ramp strategies lately, you know, the, the answer to the question "How do I win?" is Hist Grove. Um, you can dedicate a lot more slots in your deck to mid medium cost cards and removal spells when you're running Hist Grove because eventually you are going to generate two eight eights, right, for one card. Which sort of answers the question, how am I going to win? While also fueling your general strategy for getting to that point by ramping your magicka and allowing you to deploy multiple answers per turn. But just make sure that you know, for, like I said, frequently the answer to how do I, how am I going to win, will overlap with the answer to the why am I building this deck. You know, what what is my build around card? What is my general basic strategy? But just make sure you can answer that question with how am I going to win. Um, and again, <coughs> cards that develop multiple threats for um, one card, uh, cards that generate um, multiple bodies, you know, Supreme Atromancer, stuff like that, are generally a good answer to how am I going to win. Uh, but don't take up your entire deck with how am I going to win. Don't neglect answers because, you know, the removal spells, the card draw, the, the support system for your final victory is, you know, what's going to allow you to win in the first place. Uh, a lot of control decks will just beat you down with whatever they have left over at the end of the game because it doesn't matter anymore because you have no your you know the opponent has no cards in hand and you can beat somebody down for 30 turns with a tree minder if you're making sure that your opponent never generates an additional threat uh, the other thing that you can do to build a deck is uh, something I want to talk more about in our next uh, episode this is kind of a two-part series but the other thing you can do to uh, com you know come up with a new deck uh, that you want to take on the ladder is counter the current meta um, if what we just discussed about uh, build around cards and coming up with linear coherent strategies is the uh, foundation of a game's metagame, the metagame being the uh, the decks you can expect to see in the competitive um, circuit at any given time, then uh, decks that counter the meta, decks uh, are uh, are the scaffolding of you know, the entire structure. Whereas, you don't have these things unless you have something to build them on top of. Uh, you you also really aren't, in, you know, enjoying everything the game has to offer if you're only building these linear strategies. So, what we're going to be talking about next episode is, uh, and this is going to be probably the most um, complicated episode that we've had so far from Loser Legend, but what we're going to be talking about is ways to build decks to counter the other decks you're, uh, you're fighting against. Both in, in broad broad terms, um, you know, like uh, removal good, <laughs> and of course more nuanced answers where we're going to actually for the first time look at the decks that are very common on the ladder right now at that you know next weekend, which I assume is going to be pretty similar to what's popular right now, and uh, you know talk about how you can attack the meta as opposed to just attacking the you know the game you know trying to just win by attacking your opponent, you can instead attack 
what you're guessing is going to be the predominant strategy that your opponents will have. Uh, you know, just just a few notes of that sort of nature. Um, you know, playing, uh, for example, playing control decks that are capable of gaining large amounts of life against Archer and Assassin is a pretty good strategy. Playing Prophecy Assassin is pretty good against Aggro. Um, you know, this sort of uh, examination is what we're going to get into next week, so I hope you all enjoyed it. Anyway, I hope you all had a good time looking at uh, how deck building works here. Um, as a bonus, just real quick, I mean bonus as if like this is going to be super exciting, I wanted to talk briefly about how I built um, my most recent deck, the uh, Spell Sword Control deck, since this is tech, you know Sunday, still part of Spell Sword Week. Uh, the way, why did I build this deck? Um, this is a meta deck, like this is a answer deck, it's not uh, a build around a certain card deck. But it kind of is, because I really wanted to play Dawnstar Healer. And a lot of people have asked me, why aren't you playing Pillaging Tribune? Why aren't you playing Pillaging Tribune? Uh, Pillaging Tribune is a great card. Um, and you can be very successful playing a Spell Sword Control deck with Pillaging Tribune. But the reason, the, the direct answer as to why Pillaging Tribune is in this deck is that I wanted to play Dawnstar Healer, and it overlaps a little bit with what Dawnstar Healer is trying to do. Uh, the less direct answer is that it costs 5 Magicka, and I was already stacking my deck full of expensive cards that I like to play. Because, you know, if I have to ask, you know, when I'm asking the question, how am I going to win, what is my strategy, what is my plan, why am I building this deck, uh, in my case, the, the answer is usually uh, I want to play the biggest, most expensive cards in the game, and I want to have a lot of fun uh, by. I mean, that's how I'm having fun in this game is by playing Odaving, by playing in this deck, Maroc, Manticora, Blood Magic Lord, and Night Shadow. <laughs> so that's why I did it. Um, but it all started because I wanted. I, I was having some success with Dawnstar Healer and Monk, and, and I I know it can be good in Spell Sword, so I built the deck. Anyway, that's it. Next week, like I said, we'll be talking about uh, ways to combat the meta. Uh, you know what you can do if you know if your last six games have been against uh, I don't know uh, monk control, which probably hasn't been the case. But if it was the case, you know we'll talk about how you can approach building a deck to answer that. So, thank you all very much for joining me. I hope you had a good time. This video went a little longer than usual for our uh, for it loser legend videos, but I had a bunch I wanted to cover. And I feel like addressing the parts in most depth like I did, especially about removal, is pretty important to anybody looking to get started in Legends deck building. I will see you all next week, everybody. Thank you very much, and good night.